Niger saw a coup last week and it seems like a critical moment as anti-France and anti-imperialist movements in the country and the region have welcomed this development. But will France and its allies try to intervene? The land of the free and the home of the brave recently welcomed a descendant of Italy's fascists. What is the emerging political dynamic between the government of Joe Biden and Giorgia Maloney? We'll be taking a look at these stories in today's episode of Daily Debrief. But before we start, do hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Niger's military junta, which took power in a coup last week, has warned that France is seeking to militarily intervene in the country. France has apparently got an authorization from the foreign minister of the deposed government, the junta claimed on Monday. Now, the situation in the West African country remains in a flux as the junta, which is called the National Council for the Safeguard of the Homeland, has consolidated its hold. Its takeover also seems quite popular. Thousands gathered in the capital on Sunday, many of whom raised slogans against France. A section even attacked the French embassy. For those following the region, this anti-French sentiment is nothing surprising. We go to Kambale Musawali for the details. Kambale, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Quite dramatic developments over the past few days. On Sunday, we saw there are huge thousands mobilizing in the capital of Niger, you know, raising anti-France slogans. In fact, I believe there was also an attack on the French embassy. And I think the developments in Niger seem to kind of mirror what has been happening in many other parts of the region as well. So, uh, could you take us through, first of all, what's uh, from the reports you have been getting, what's happening in the country right now, specifically the positions the military junta is taking and what has been the kind of response? Uh, all of us were surprised to hear, uh, but I wouldn't say all fully surprised for the region, but surprised for Niger, uh, that there was a coup on July 26. Uh, the presidential guard uh, detained the president of uh, Niger, Bazoum. He was uh, declared the winner of the election in 2021, and it's been leading the country since. Uh, there have been tensions that we could get into it as we discuss. Uh, the uh, coup or leader who you know, rose from that coup is uh, General Abdurrahman Chani, you know, and he decided to close the border. So uh, right after the coup was done to the country on the first day, there were a few people, uh, supporters of the president, Bazoum, uh, they came out uh, to ask for him to be released. Uh, they were dispersed. Uh, there were a really small number of people, usually uh, they were mostly party members of uh, the his party, which is a party Nigerian for la democracy and uh, le socialism. But after that, uh, people in vast majority evacuated to their daily tasks, uh, daily routine, but on Ju July 30th, uh, thousands came out in the streets uh, in support of the coup. Few things that were noticeable uh, in this rally. Uh, people were clearly saying, uh, France must leave, you know, no France dégage. Uh, there also, there were a few people who were carrying the Russian flag, which was quite interesting. And we've seen that across Africa, uh, in a few countries when there are these rallies, um, what does that actually mean? Now, people are speaking, are uh, expressing the need of a multipolar world uh, by seeing Russia uh, as another pole that Africans can work with. Uh, so that's at least the expression of the sentiment of the Nigerian people. But last, uh, there was a protest in front of the French embassy. Uh, they destroyed, uh, I guess, glasses and the, the facade of the building. Uh, the second in command of the army came out, uh, Salifu Modi. He came out to speak to the population, uh, to tell them uh, that they could go back. There is no need to destroy that. But clearly, the sentiment of the people, uh, as they look at the coup, beyond what the coup leaders have uh, uh, said, is that it's an expression of a position where Niger is breaking ties with France. That no, they are be, they are joining this uh, new non-alignment movement on the African continent, uh, especially in West Africa, where countries colonized by France are breaking the ties. In the case of Mali, uh, where now French is no longer the official language in the country, and French army was kicked out uh, 
in same thing in Burkina Faso, the French uh, were asked to leave the country. And as they left, uh, surprisingly, the French soldiers ended up in Niger. And now we have over 1,500, according to the French, uh, military personnel in uh, Niger. Uh, it's not to see what is going to happen to them, but it's predictable uh, that they will be asked to leave and that Niger will try to take a posture uh, that is not aligned to France. Right. Kambane, uh, interestingly, the responses have been quite predictable. We have the ECOWAS, the body of West African countries, you know, being very strong in its condemnation. The European Union has sided with the ECOWAS. France and the US also have pretty much, you know, endorsed that stance. There has been even some talk of military intervention if necessary. So how do you see these responses and how credible are these, uh, for lack of better words, threats? I think... On the part of France, I uh, follow very closely the statement that came out from Emmanuel Macron. Uh, he's clearly stating that uh, France will do everything in their power to protect the citizen and French interests. And we know what is French interest in uh, Niger. French interest in Niger is directly Arriva, you know, the French mining company that's extracting uranium. Um, France needs the uranium of the Sahel, needs the uranium of Niger to light up uh, the um, the bulb, the, the light bulb in the country, the electricity of France is uh, run by uranium from the region. So I'm really worried about the position of France uh, based on the internal issues inside of uh, uh, Niger. But the other one that's quite uh, interesting, right, and leaving us a bit perplexed is the position of ECOWAS. Uh, the regional body in West Africa. Uh, ECOWAS has given uh, the coup platter, uh, the coup leaders, seven days to bring back uh, Bazoum, uh, bring back constitutional order, uh, so called democracy. And they say that they will not tolerate uh, another coup. I think ECOWAS leaders are not in tune with what is happening in the region. We had Mali. We had uh, Burkina Faso, we had Guinea, and there will be more coups in the region happening. And this is an expression, particularly in the Francophone Africa, of African people saying that they refuse to be under the tutelage of Western power. They refuse to be under the tutelage of France. They do not want France to control the currency. They do not want France to control their mineral resources. And this has been ongoing for over a decade, where Progress, uh, uh, progressive organization and people have mobilized the people of Africa, particularly in West Africa, around French imperialism in the region. And people today, from the young child, four or five year old, to the adults in the 80s, they are clear and they are all saying the same word. You go to Senegal, you hear France dégage. You go to Mali, you hear France dégage. You go to Burkina Faso, same thing. And then you end up in Niger. People are also saying France dégage. That simply means France must leave the region. But more importantly, France must leave the African continent because they are exploiting our resources. They are controlling currencies of uh, some of the Af uh, Francophone African countries and Africans are not benefiting. So when ECOWAS leaders are saying uh, that they're giving uh, the cool leaders seven days, they're not in tune with the aspirations of African people. They're not in tune with the aspiration of Nigerian people. The Nigerian people in the street demonstrated what they want. They carried the Russian flag. They say France dégage. Is ECOWAS saying France dégage? Is ECOWAS saying France must leave the region? If they are not saying that, they're not in tune with that. The second one that they are not in tune is the level of corruption that has been unfolding uh, in the region. You know, people may say that there was a peaceful, the first peaceful transfer of power in 2021. Uh, that's what the Western media is saying that happened in 2021. When you speak to everyone in Niger who was following uh, the situation in the country, uh, they will let you know that the election was rigged that opposition leaders were sidelined, that the, the new president 
which is Mohammed ba, um, uh, Bazoum, was the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, handpicked by the former uh, president of uh, Niger. So people already have uh, seen him a lack of um, leadership first, but also he does not have the aspiration of the people. There have been other issues such as uh, his uh, Bazoum's criticism to the military, where he said to the military they're not adequate to uh, bring down the uh, jihadists uh, in the region, right? So if the president of the country does not have confidence in the military, what would you expect the military to do? So this coup uh, is an expression of that. But my worry with ECOWAS is that they should, each ECOWAS countries should look into what is happening in their internal, uh, in their own countries. You know, we have challenges in Togo. We have challenges in Ghana. We have challenges in Nigeria. A military intervention for ECOWAS is going to be a disaster because the people of Niger are in support of the decisions of the coup plotters. And some of the decisions they've made was to tackle corruption, to actually um, start going after the, the, the ministers and anyone who was in the government who embezzled money. So these populist actions directly uh, from the population is something that the population is in support. ECOWA should not follow the position of the United States or France. ECOWA should listen uh, to the people of Niger for a resolution to the, uh, the crisis. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kambale, for explaining that. And I think pointing out a very central fact that this is not a process in one country. This is a process across the region. And I think a lot of our analysis and coverage that we read often completely uh, misses that point and, you know, just puts it in very simplistic terms. So thank you so much for explaining that. Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni has been in the thick of controversy ever since taking power and even before. She has taken a harsh line on immigration, slashed welfare policies, and her government has initiated a crackdown on journalists in civil society. And of course, she and her party have mainstreamed far-right-wing and fascist ideas. But there has been one element of continuity from the previous government, her support to the war in Ukraine. Maybe that's why she was so warmly greeted during her recent trip to the US. President Joe Biden, who never tires of attacking Donald Trump and his right-wing policies, had very warm words for the Italian Prime Minister. If you're confused, it's not surprising. And for some clarity, we go to Maurizio Coppola of the Italian left party, Potere il Popolo. Maurizio, thank you so much for joining us. Now, the US establishment always, you know, very eager to talk about, you know, condemn far-right movements when it comes to their own country. But a very warm meeting between Biden and Georgia Meloni on a uh, few days ago when she visited the United States. So, uh, considering all, the, all these discussions, why has Italy become such a valuable ally for the United States at this point? Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I think uh, Italy is trying to like take the leadership inside of the European Union. Uh, the situation in Germany, where the far right is increasing, is putting under pressure the Social Democrats and the Green Alliance in government. The situation in France, for example, where uh, Macron is under pressure and there is a huge polarization in the society with a very strong far right and also a left, the prog progressive left increasing. Uh, there is like a space opening. And so Italy becomes like wants to occupy this uh, space that is opened by the crisis uh, internally in Europe. And of course, there is also uh, a geopolitical question because Italy uh, inside of the Mediterranean area is a key uh, player and uh, the United States know it exactly. And, uh, and they know it since a long time because Italy is still the ground of uh, over 120 military bases from NATO and the US. Right. So in context, of course, I think two or three things are important. One is that uh, Italy has, uh, you know, despite all this talk about the far right being less supportive of the war, the current government has been very much in the center, you know, very much pro the Ukraine war, pro the Western position on that. So could you also maybe tell us a bit about what positions the Georgia Meloni government has taken on that issue? Well, since the very first moment of, of, uh, of, of the war, of the invasion of Russia, already uh, uh, Mario Draghi, the former prime minister, took a very strong position in supporting NATO, in supporting the US in this, uh, in this war. When Giorgia Meloni was elected, she did like, a, she made a continuation of, of, that, uh, of that position. And it is clear that Italy uh, is having a key role in uh, delivering arms 
uh, Italy is like one of the main uh, countries delivering arms uh, and weapons uh, to Ukraine. But also, as I said before, the position in the Mediterranean area uh, where Italy has like the military bases that are used since the first days of the war uh, for like uh, um, uh, having like uh, some monitoring of the area, uh, both all from Sicily of Sigonella. And, and uh, third, Italy is having also a key role in the reconstruction of, uh, of Ukraine. As you know, there was uh, in the last weeks a meeting in London, the second reconstruction uh, um, uh, meeting uh, with the uh, Ukrainian uh, government, uh, corporations and European governments. And Italy wants to capture new, uh, new investment possibilities inside of, of Ukraine. So Italy is having like this role of trying to I mean, they find alliances, of course, also with Germany and other countries. But it is like like the vanguard of like this this kind of trying to perpetuating the war because they know exactly war is producing a social situation uh, for uh, for which they can also like politically then uh, win and uh, stabilize their uh, their uh, rule. Right. Of course, uh, important to note, and I think we have talked about this before, also happening at a time when Italy is also in some senses taking leadership of Europe when it comes to the Mediterranean refugee crisis as well. And, you know, we're very much in the forefront of this right-wing agenda there. Yeah, exactly. And it is not a case that uh, at the same time when Giorgia Meloni uh, was in the US uh, discussing uh, and uh, making agreements with uh, Joe Biden, uh, that there was also like what happened in Niger. So already a couple of weeks before there was the agreement between the European Union and uh, Sayed, the, the president of Tunisia, the agreement that uh, that is foreseeing that 250 million uh, of euros are given to the uh, to the Tunisian state in a deep crisis. We know also that there is like an agreement uh, between the Tunisian state the government and the IMF. They are uh, working on that, but they have they are Tunisia is in a deep crisis, and Europe and above all Italy, as also like the geographical uh, situation of Italy in the Mediterranean area. Uh, they are pushing pressure to block, to have like to externalize the borders of of, uh, of Europe. So Tunisia is a key uh, is, is, a, is a key uh, moment, but also Niger. Why Niger? Because there was like this what happened in the in the last days. Uh, it's very important. Italy uh, um, uh, rapidly expressed itself, uh, um, condemning like this uh, what happened in the military, protecting like the. Uh, um, uh, the, the the current president that that is like a president in favor of of Europe uh, because Italy has a key role they they developed in March April 2023 the so-called Piano Mattei it's a it's a plan to how position it itself again in uh, in Africa in the African continent for Italy and so it uh, it foresees like that Italy will be a key uh, uh, co country for all the energy supply coming from. Uh, from uh, from from the African continent, above all uh, from Algeria, but not only Algeria, but also Libya and so on. Uh, Italy wants to play a key role in uh, externalizing the borders of Euro of the of Europe uh, inside of of Niger, of course, but also Libya, Turkey, and so on. They are like the key countries uh, from which from where the, the the refugees are coming. And then there is also all the question uh, of um, of the fight against jihadism. And uh, the Niger situation now, it's like provoking a lot of uh, headache inside of the European governments. Right, Maritz, it's interesting because I believe at various points, Georgia Meloni, you know, has uh, made speeches where she seems to be uh, criticizing the role of France, for instance, in many of these countries, but then turns it around to say that, you know, we should make it in such a way that people from Africa don't come to Europe. So it actually the criticism of French imperialism is just a way of saying that, you know, uh, we should uh, not have more refugees in this context. So how does Italy see itself as kind of being central to the politics of energy? Is it also trying to sort of uh, push out France in this process? Yeah, of course. I think there is never like, uh, we sometimes we think that the bourgeoisie has a logic. It, everything is like linear. But we see this is a very concrete case in which like the different bourgeois interests are also like uh, colliding. Uh, with each other and i think italy al already in libya there was this huge topic about like uh, how france played the the game to stabilize the interests of total in in libya against the interests of any the uh, italian uh, oil producer and today we have the same the same question with uh, with algeria but also uh, above all also with uh, niger so there is like a, a key role that the italian government is playing to protect 
the interests of the uh, energy companies of the Italian energy companies and and for that of course uh, it is also like colliding these interests they are attacking France for what they are they did and what they are doing in 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 Niger but I think that at the end uh, what Italy really wants is just to stabilize the profits of the of the of the of the energy companies there is no alternative point of view from Italy there is not giving back a sovereignty to these countries and so on and so on it's really i think in that there is a common uh, a common point with france also they want just to block uh, migrants to to keep poor the people there uh, and to extract all the profits they can from the territories of the african continent and i think it's because of that that we need also to in a way uh, try to bring together the movements uh, protesting against against this and I just want to underline that last week when the agreement between the European Union and uh, the Tunisian uh, government was done, uh, a common agreement between Poter al Popolo, Power to the People and the Tunisian Workers' Party uh, was uh, produced and was uh, distributed into the, to the, to the uh, media because it is important that we show that this, there is a common struggle and the common interest of the working classes uh, in the different continents and we have to uh, to strengthen this common uh, unitary process against uh, uh, imperialism. Right, Manizio, thank you so much for that analysis. I think a lot of this is often missed when we cover uh, diplomatic visits, some of the internal dynamics, like you said. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. And that's all we have time for in today's episode. So we've taken a look at the coup and the political situation in Niger and also thought about why the United States has no issues associating with the far-right government of Georgia Maloney. We'll be delving into many more such topics in future episodes of Daily Debrief. Keep watching and don't forget to hit that subscribe button.